examples so that I can confirm that. Excellent. Thank you. Alia, 2021. This is the first of three sessions for this week. And if you are here, you're certainly meant to be here. Please do keep yourself muted if it's not your turn to speak and um, be ready to unmute yourself as soon as you can. Now, it's great to see those of you who have signed in through WOVA, um, the, the platform that we are currently using. Um, so use it as best as you can. Connect with someone, ask questions, and let's form a community over there. Today, we're here for the Data for Development conversation. Tomorrow, we shall be talking about putting citizens at the heart of philanthropic decisions. And the day after that, we have the high-level forum on data governance. It's going to be exciting, and we are pumped about this. Now, I want right at the outset to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you that have taken the time to spend three ever-precious hours um, today with us at this Bundwani session. Um, it is not easy nowadays because we have death by Zoom. Um, we used to have death by PowerPoint. Nowadays, we have death by Zoom. So it is really good that you found time for us to be able to spend time together. You know, when Jay and I started organizing Buntuani back in 2013, um, we were experiencing some fatigue of attending events that were more about protocol than they were about action. Um, we craved industry-wide conversation where people said publicly what they would only be comfortable saying privately of a coffee. All too often, we attended events where speakers would start by saying, let me be perfectly clear, and then proceed to, to, ob proceed to obfuscate their statement behind some politically correct jargon and buzzwords that sounded great, but usually meant very little. I know that all of you have been to such events. So we decided to organize an event where people would leave their titles and trappings at the door and sit in a circle as equals. Buntuani was inspired by a place right here in Malindi, where I am, um, by the beach that is not very far from where I am, where elders would sit together under, in a circle under a tree, and they would speak candidly about the issues of their time. We have held several Buntuani meetings in person um, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in South Africa, in Ghana. And because of the challenges of COVID, this one is virtual. But I do call upon you today to consider this space a circle. It is a place of equal minds that have something to discuss. We ask you to be candid, to be incisive, to be provocative as much as you can. We ask that today we address ourselves plainly to the issues of our times in a way that can stimulate us to act individually, but also to collaborate with each other. Now, the issues of our time are many, and they're diverse, from the battles that we've had with COVID-19 over the past two years, um, and other serious diseases, um, to climate change, to increasing nationalism and bigotry, to increasing apathy among citizens of, in many parts of Africa, and the growing disenfranchisement of youth that we are seeing. We really have a lot to talk about, especially because data is at the center of all of these issues. Today, we're here to talk about data systems. The World Bank released a very powerful report, the World Data Report, one that we dare say will, be, will guide policy and action over the next um, couple of years. And we think that it will have great effect. But the one question we have, and we hope that we can shed light on today is this. Can we truly have an integrated national data system if it does not involve villages and counties? if it does not involve citizens, not just as consumers of insights from data, but also as producers of data that can better be accessed by government. The belief that we have held since 2015 when the global goals were launched was that the achievement of the sustainable development goals can best be achieved from the hyper-local level upwards, from village to district to county to province, to the state, to the country, and beyond. How do we build these systems at subnational level? Now, I am really happy to see all of you here and um, to start us off in this conversation, the Director for Development Data Group at the, at the World Bank, Haishan Fu, is here with us. And Haishan, I'm going to invite you now um, to set us off 
um, and get us thinking about um, you know, what we need to be thinking about. And then um, from there, uh, we shall take it forward. Welcome. Thank you so much, Al. Um, I'm pumped by you. Uh, this is just a really wonderful. I, I'm such. Uh, I'm so honored uh, to be with all of you here today. Uh, uh, as the Kenyan proverbs goes, uh, having a good discussion is like having riches. So it's really is great uh, to have this important discussion on how we can scale up support for subnational data systems. Um, for it to be really the crucial part, uh, the the, uh, the cornerstone of uh, the integrated national data system um, and having this uh, discussion in the context of the World Development Report 2021 data for better lives. Uh, as, 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 as Elle uh, alluded to, uh, and as you know, this year's uh, WDR has been really groundbreaking as it's the first uh, uh, ever, first ever World Development Report devoted entirely to the topic of data. At its core, uh, the w WDR aims to answer one extremely important question. How can we harness more value from data in ways that can help us to help the lives of people who are poor, marginalized, and frequently underrepresented uh, or invisible in many data systems? And what's the report's answer to this question? That we need to get all of societies to engage from the grassroots level, from uh, the, the uh, communities upwards, to engage in a dialogue around developing a new social contract grounded uh, in the principles of value, trust, and equity to transform how data can be used to improve people's lives. A contract that will enhance our ability to use and reuse data to create more economic and social values, and a contract that will ensure that every person and every country and every community can benefit equally from data. And importantly, a contract that will foster people's trust in data by guarding against misuse. So a central ten tenant of the report is the need to recognize that data is reusable and it is frequently used once and filed away or deliberately not shared. For this reason, the report asserts that much of the value of data to improve lives is left untapped. So as such, an important message of the report is that we all need to work on finding ways to get more value out of data by reusing and repurposing data to provide insight to uh, unexpected problems coming our way. This also meant greater access and greater sharing of data. So how does more access to data improve lives? Uh, as we all know, one governments and even private sector, private sector institutions have more data, they can improve their decision-making and uh, efficiency and better match supply and demand. All of this can lead to economic growth and correspond improvement in economic opportunities and well-being, including in the lives of the most vulnerable among us. At the same time, when non-governmental actors like civil society organizations, citizens, and academics use data, they can be powerful force to create greater transparency and accountability of both the public and private sectors. And we know Pantuani is playing such a great role in this space. In addition to talking about the positive ways in which data can impact our lives, the World Development Report also discusses how access to more data could open up the risk for data to be used to harmful effects across different pathways. So how can we balance this need to harness data for greater social and economic progress with the need to ensure that it's not used to harm government's firms and most importantly, people? So realizing greater value from data requires that both more people have access to data and data is shared more, used more, and repurposed more to solve new problems. At the same time, it also requires and people stand to gain from sharing the values generated by data in order to ensure their active participation. So as a result, 
to realize data's potential, we need a common framework that is built around the data system that not only ensures safety, but also actively promotes access to data. It is really to this end, the WDR provides an aspirational vision of what it, what it calls an integrated national data system or INDS, which can serve to enhance data flows across different stakeholders, public, private, civil uh, uh, societies and individuals, allowing all to benefit from data use. An integrated national data system also facilitates innovative and creative ways of using data to solve existing and emerging problems. The WDR 2021 provides a clear description of what countries could, should be aiming for as they take steps towards such an integrated data system. But as El said very beautifully, we won't have such a meaningful system if we're not organizing ourselves from the the basic community level ground up so that we can really develop such meaningful relationship among all the uh, uh, players um, in order to fulfill this aspiration. I'm really glad that we're having this, uh, this discussion today and thank you uh, Bogwani for really organizing us together and, and I wish that we can all sit together in a circle to, to, to really uh, engage and, and debate and uh, discuss among ourselves. Because what a better time to take this issue than in the year of 2021. This moment in history really brings together a variety of key issues and trends we know will have radical implications for the way we do data. But on the one hand, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought what the WDR advocates for to the fore. That is the foundational role of public intent data, the huge potential of private intent data and system generated data, and how the combination of this data could yield endless new insight. At the same time, the pandemic also reminded us that the data revolution that the international development community has called for has not quite happened the way we, we had hoped for. The reality is that still currently, more than 110 low and middle income countries still lack the resources and technical capacity to modernize their data and statistical systems, leaving millions of people invisible to the state thus remain vulnerable. And we also know how low and uh, lower middle income countries statistical capacity has been squeezed during the pandemic and how their operations have been disrupted and their ability to compile basic statistics has been compromised. According to a recent global survey of national statistical offices um, conducted by the UN and the World Bank, nearly seven out of 10 recently uh, I mean, seven out of 10 national uh, countries uh, recently had difficulty in meeting international uh, reporting requirements uh, under the SDGs, as opposed to approximately one in less than five of their counterparts in richer countries. The survey also revealed regional differences in COVID-19's impact on national statistics offices' ability to fulfill their uh, national and international data needs. Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, North Africa, and Western Asia have been the most adversely affected regions. The situation was unfortunately similar um, for crucial short-term statistics. Only one third of countries in these regions reported experiencing no negative impact uh, from the pandemic on this important aspect of their uh, operations. Of course, this is due in part to the pandemic, but it is also because of the long-term underinvestment in modernizing statistical operations and data infrastructures. We all know this is a painful fact. Uh, a mere 0.3% of overseas development assistance is estimated to go specifically towards data and statistical priorities annually. And the fragmentation of existing support further compounds the problem. So the COVID-19 pandemic has made us all realize that we can no longer ignore the urgency to bring the national data system in these countries into the digital age, 
towards what the WDR 2021 has outlined as an integrated national data system. This system with the right infrastructure, regulatory and legal framework, economic policies, institutional and human capacity, as well as meaningful private and public sector partnership at national and subnational levels. This is a huge challenge that we're all facing together. The reality is that the widening global data inequality will no doubt further widen the gaps in the ability of governments to make informed evidence-based decisions. And therefore, it will further widen the global inequality in many dimensions across countries. So this discussion we're having here today is just absolutely critical. And I'm so glad that Gondwani is giving priority to our collective thinking uh, in this space. So I really think that there's no better time for all national governments and international development communities and donors to really commit to prioritizing investment in the data agenda. The time has really come for governments and donors to set clear targets for investing their resources in supporting the fundamental public sector data generation and developing meaningful public and private partnership to tap into the wider range of, of data. And here, I just want to quickly mention three points. First, when I'm talking about finance data, I don't really mean merely covering the cost of essential data production, but really prioritizing investment in data as a development agenda in its own right, which is bound to yield multitude of returns. Although I must admit that our ability to quantify such returns still remains so inadequate. So this is one critical area that we all need to work on together. And I hope our discussion will also lead us to some joint initiative in this regard. Second, it is often easier to see how donors and others channel investment in other sectors uh, where some evident human uh, outcomes could be clearly monitored. Here, I must say that sector investment, which sometimes include data component, has its benefit, but it might not always yield the desired data improvement we need. This is because new data needs oftentimes must be addressed through a system change and overall infrastructure in, in improvement, both in terms of technology and legal and institutional structure and, and capacity. So it is important for us to look at how to focus on investment in the data sector as a connected, coherent strategy. Third, in light of the chronic underinvestment in public intent data, we should also think hard about what new incentive we need and what new financing models we should invent in order to address some of the underlying challenges that the existing models might not be able to overcome. This includes scaling up private sector contributions, not only in terms of funding, but also practical solutions they can offer to us in order for us to join hands and direct financing towards the most promising and scalable solutions to countries. And at the same time, to foster uh, grassroots innovation and collab collaborative uh, uh, initiatives in order to indeed identify and experiment ways those scalable solutions and to work together to scale them. So having said all of this, I still believe that existing approaches, once prioritized right, could yield additional opportunities and incentives as desired. This entails uh, domestic investment targeted towards the right for artists investing in the data system towards its integrated vision, uh, combined with a complementary international external financing that include both trust fund based resources as well as uh, IBRD or IDA type of financing instrument. Actually, I'm very happy to share that uh, even before the onset of the pandem pandemic, during the IDA 19 replenishment, the bank was able to mobilize a record 82 billion US dollars in IDA financing. And much of it is connected to what we can do in countries to support national data system improvement and transformation. This included a commitment to addressing the improvement for the fundamental need of basic data 
produced by national statistical system in over 30 low and low, lower middle income countries. Uh, many of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. In just the last fiscal year alone, almost 2.6 billion US dollar uh, in terms of IDA and IBRD support had a data or statistical component in it. But the challenge is how we can make sure that this uh, investment are coherent and connected to yield step change uh, in the data system rather than fragmented into marginal improvement in different sectors. And more importantly, how we can ensure those investments can really benefit the community level, sub-national level need. In addition to channeling financing support to countries, we must also deliver on the transformational, uh, transformational need that countries have that would require our joint investment in global data public goods, which matter at the national, global, and subnational levels, such as new standards, new data governance arrangements, new principles in this regard, and new data technology application that can yield scaled impact within countries and for individual communities. So this requires consolidated and coordinated trust fund-based investment for us to pull resources together and uh, collaborate so that we can um, really work together across uh, key partners to be able to generate those new standards, tools, and practical solutions. There is definitely an urgent need uh, to establish data, develop data partnership between public institutions and private sectors at the country and subnational levels. We have been experimenting at international level with, with uh, for example, IMF, uh, IADB, um, OECD, and UNDP uh, had been able to uh, create a divine partnership based on harmonized legal agreement and uh, uh, secured joint uh, technology platform with over 25 private companies uh, to uh, experiment with how their data could be accessed um, for uh, the uh, staff in uh, country operations to so access those data and connect those data with practical operational challenges and, and to see what new insight we get. We very much like to work with uh, uh, countries and, and uh, uh, subnational uh, communities to see how such uh, data partnership could be realized at the national and subnational levels. This is really, really important if we were to uh, uh, aim towards this integrated uh, data system based on the new social contract as advocated by WDR 2021. Of course, to address all of the needs, um, I, uh, World Bank has taken a step and we have uh, formally launched the global data facility at the 2021 UN World Data Forum in Bern last month. The, the Global Data Facility is a new trust fund hosted by the World Bank designed to mobilize and coordinate donor support for data and statistical priorities, uh, not just at global level, but supporting regional, national, and subnational data agenda. The Global Data Facility is really a result of a collaboration with the UN country partners, uh, global partnerships such as Paris 21 and Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, as well as the broader donor community. Through extensive consultations, um, all of those partners have helped shape the priorities for support by the Global Data Facility and have uh, ensured that the facility will be further developed and uh, deliver on countries' national and statistical need and demands. Indeed, the Global Data Facility is designed to ensure that countries' national and sub-national needs drive investment and to scale up and improve coordination across development partners, practitioners, and country clients. It will catalyze larger financing, including through the World Bank's IDA and IBRD loans and grants to support countries' data agenda, operationalization of their agenda. It will also enable longer term support for data and statistics priorities by better uh, mobilizing uh, domestic investment. Uh, we really hope that operating in tandem with other initiatives such as the Burn Network's Clearinghouse, which was also launched at the World Data Forum, 
the global data facility will help to optimize coordination alignment of support and priorities around the world. So I'm really uh, hopeful that the global data facility will bring us uh, closer to realizing or supporting the realization of the aspirational new social contract for data put forward by the WDR. And it will also help achieve this by supporting investment to enhance trust in data and data integrity and enable more and better data use, reuse and sharing decision making at scale. I just want to really echo what Elle said at the very beginning, the importance of working at sub-national level with our local communities. Uh, the, the global data facility uh, is operating in the spirit of think globally, act locally, will be guided by what you are discussing here today. And I really hope we can continue to uh, engage with each other and collaborate to ensure that the, the global data facility will be really offering meaningful support to what you're going to pursue together. I really cannot wait to work with all of you, scale up support for subnational data system and revolutionize the global data, uh, 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 global data ecosystem from the bottom up. So with that, Al, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts. Thank you so much, um, Haishan, for those very powerful words. Um, I was um, really enjoying um, listening to you because some of the things that you have raised are, are particularly important for, for, for us. And you know, we are just about to get um, very practical um, with the next session that um, Craig Hammer um, is going to be moderating in a few minutes. And I know that you're going to be leaving us soon, so I want to make sure that I I, 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 I milk as much out of you as I can in terms of ideas. And the specific question that um, I, I wanted to ask you um, to, to sort of see if you can help us with is, I mean, we already know that only just about 0.3% uh, percent goes in towards financing of data initiatives um, globally. And we know that a, a very big part of that challenge is that people cannot see the linear, um, result out of that investment. So they, they expect to see a linear result and usually that's very difficult to show. How can, two questions, how can we get um, to convince the wider community? How do we make this conversation mainstream that it is actually important to still kick in additional investment in data? What are the sort of arguments that we must make um, collectively as a group so that it becomes mainstream that we must increase um, the investment in data without necessarily expecting a linear result? Um, and how can civil society organizations um, at national or subnational level uh, be supportive to the agenda that is put forth uh, by the WDR? You can hear me? I hear you fine. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, indeed. As I mentioned uh, in my, in my uh, remarks, the return to investment in data is not well documented. This really put a huge challenge to the broader development uh, economics research community. I know that they rely on data for their you know, powerful research, but very few studies is at, are de actually dedicated to the issue of uh, addressing or evaluating, assessing what is the impact of investment in data in its multitude of, of you know, uh, returns. So this is a collective challenge I'm, I'm putting out. Actually, for many years, I've been coding for a more concerted effort in this area. And I'm also hope if the global data facility could foster such a research um, so that we will have more real, real success stories to bring to the decision makers, to the donor community. Second issue is that we must have a mindset. Uh, for so long, when we talk about investing in data, we talk about the cost of data production rather than really the meaningful work of investment in data. This requires us a fundamental mind shift for us to look at investment in data as a development agenda in its own right 
rather than just a supportive means for, for, for an end. As we know, the COVID-19 made it very clear, data is part of our being, data is part of our economy, data is part of our society. It's, it's, it's not just the lifeblood, it's also the infra, basic infrastructure, however you call it. it it's connected to the broader digital, digitalized transformation of all we do. So this has to be really pursued in that regard, rather than just marginalized standalone investment in investing in a set of data we need, but rather the fundamental change. That's what, how powerful the WBR is. It's require us to invest in infrastructure, in, in the, what we call the data uh, infrastructure, data structure, as well as data capital. So both the infrastructure, uh, institutional and technological, but also the human and inst institutional capacities. Uh, as 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 a as a coherent uh, agenda, and uh, civil societies and 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 and, and uh, institutions as a uh, Boswani is absolutely critical. You are connecting us, you know, the public sector, the private sector, the citizens, and so you are the glue in many ways to for us to really engage with each other uh, to foster the the thinking along those lines. But more importantly, to devise the practical means for us to. If I, if I could just push you a little bit to to um, to engage me on on a particular thought that has that you have stimulated, it is the role of of innovation and experimentation in finding um, a, you know sort of better evidence. Um, in your experience, what sort of um, innovation would you like to see? Um, stimulated by the global um, data facility and the and the uh, world uh, data report, what sort of innovation are you hoping to see over the next couple of years, um, and in what areas uh, specifically? Um, as as we're talking about uh, uh, how to really tap into the value of data, which is not just public intent data produced by government data system, which will continue to remain the fundamental part of any data system that we must uh, continue to find new ways to support. It's also about tapping into the larger, uh, broad range of digital data, now currently mostly in the hands of private sector. So I see it's really in important for us to find creative ways to build that partnership to ensure that those data currently in the hands of private sectors could be used for social good. And this required many different level of innovation. First of all, there is the issue of uh, data governance in the basic principles governing how those data could be shared and how well we're tapping into its broader social value to ensure the privacy issues, ethical use issues will be addressed. And we're not yet there uh, as a global community. Therefore, experimental, uh, experimentation in that regard and working collaboratively is very critical. Uh, in the WDR, actually, the um, uh, Committee for the Coordination of uh, Statistical Activities, which is a body of over 46 international statistical agencies, have come together and put forward an idea of uh, uh, pursuing collectively through a political process a global a principle, global universal principle, and, and also global convention, a data convention to help us reach uh, this level of, uh, of uh, understanding and, and uh, practical uh, solutions. Uh, at the same time, it's about experimenting how we really can uh, facilitate such, such data sharing and data access. Um, so this is why we're experimenting with uh, how to build harmonized legal agreement, how to build secured IT platform, and how to incentivize private sector to come together so that their data can be used. Because as the WDR demonstrated in the report, oftentimes this one, those public intent data and private data, uh, intent data combined yield very practical, impactful solutions at a community level that really help change lives, uh, be it uh, you know, improvement of transportation, improvement of access to energy, 
so on and so forth. So it's really, I see a huge potential and this is where uh, collaborative innovation is urgent. Um, there are 110 countries that um, were not able to report um, during the VNR for the um, sustainable development goals. Um, and, you know, that's actually illustrative of the number of countries that are still uh, very far behind in terms of their ability to use um, data to track them, their, their progress better, um, to have the systems that they need to have. Um, what are the sort of things that the, perhaps the global um, data facility will likely be doing with those countries that are farthest left behind um, to sort of bring them on board? Is there some kind of affirmative action um, envisioned um, in the global data facility for, for those um, countries and communities that are very, very far behind to come closer to the rest? Yeah, I think the, the whole uh, the idea behind the global data facility is to uh, ensure that uh, we come together, donors and development agencies coming together to commit to support uh, those countries uh, because public intent data produced by government statistical system are the bedrocks of, of any future data systems. And we must not lose sight of, of how urgent for us to scale up our investment uh, in, in those countries. Um, this is where we really hope that through the global data facility, we will support the Cape Town Global Action Plans, which is uh, adopted by the UN as a, as a blueprint for us to support these countries for the left behind in the spirit of leaving no one behind of SDGs so that we can really give priorities to those countries. And at the same time, it is really about how we can not only incentivize domestic investment, but how we can really make sure that external support through either IBRD kind of loans uh, and grant as well as trust fund based the uh, financing to address both countries' operational need and the need for technical assistance and the development of new approaches so we can take to countries. So I really hope that this will become a new global compact uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, months to come so that we can really have this collective commitment and holding us uh, accountable that's why I think the uh, Clearing House launched at the um, UN World Data Forum is, is one of the ways uh, for us to uh, really monitor how the resources from multi uh, bilateral and uh, multilateral development partners are channeled towards those countries so that we can really address their most urgent need. And I'm also glad that uh, the UN uh, Under Secretary General uh, and our World Bank Managing Director for Development Policies and Partnership agreed to convene a Development uh, Partners Forum uh, early next year uh, in order to secure such commitment. We shall very much look forward to that and perhaps that will be the day that uh, we meet physically um, <laughs> um, after so many years of not traveling um, anywhere. Thank you very, very much, Haishan, for Thank your time. You and for, for your contribution. We're just about to move to um, a more practitioner level conversation um, that is going to be um, uh, moderated by my good friend, Craig Hammer, who is a program manager in charge of, uh, you know, at the data development group. That's, for some countries, that is a very hard thing to say, Craig, data development group. <laughs> so, but it's it's great to see you, Craig. And just before you start, and as as um, your panelists, uh, Natalia, Philip, Omar, and Louise are, are getting themselves in place, um, I know that Esther has prepared a little video for us to um, to see. Um, it's a short one, um, so we'll start with that, and then immediately we will cut into Craig as he proceeds with the practitioner insights um, uh, forum. Thank you very much. Over to you, Esther. Devolution in Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. 
We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eke out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? These thoughts inspired the Ability Project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders, county chief officers, who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, and now over to you, Craig. Um, I will welcome you so that you can invite um, your, your panelists. Thanks, thanks very much, Al. And, um, and I really want to say good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening to everybody. And, and thanks for making the time to join us for this discussion today. Uh, I really want to thank our hosts, um, Al, uh, Jay, and colleagues at the Open Institute for uh, the chance to join you for the Buntuani Open Summit. Uh, and Al, as we said before, we're very much hoping that by the time the next Boon 20 rolls around, we'll all be together in person, hopefully much more, um, uh, much before that. Uh, we have about 75 minutes together today uh, before we get sorted into breakout groups for a bit of a deeper discussion. Um, so I just will get started. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, with us today a tremendous group of expert practitioners uh, who are themselves focused on supporting data and statistics at the national, subnational, but also global level. Um, and, and can bring very specific insights into some of the questions and, 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 and topics that Al, you and, and Haishan had been discussing a bit uh, a few minutes back. Um, we have Luis Gerardo Gonzalez Morales, who is Chief of the Web Development and Data Visualization Unit and Focal Point on Data Revolution for Sustainable Development at the United Nations Statistical Division. We have Natalia Carfi, who's Executive Director of the Open Data Charter. We have Umar Sarijuddin, who is Manager for Development Indicators and Data Services uh, with the World Bank's Development Data Group, which is where I work. We have Philippe Gafishi, who is Interregional Advisor for Paris 21. And we have Silvano Fumega, who is Research and Policy Director at ILDA, and also the Director of the Global Data Barometer. 
Uh, I really want to welcome all of our panelists and uh, looking forward to having a good discussion today. So to pick up a bit on the threads of what Haishan had mentioned, I think just to, to get a clear sense of what the state of play is for national citizens offices and their subnational uh, uh, offices as well. Um, let's turn to Lewis first. Lewis, let's, let's start by talking about the impact of COVID-19 a bit more specifically on, on NSOs. Um, you know, throughout the last 18 months, what's happened to data collection and dissemination processes during this time? And, and what have we found um, where needs, uh, what, what it means for needs and, and what support is needed? Uh, and at, at the national and subnational level, what, what, what can you share about that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. And, and, and thank you, everybody, to, to, uh, for, for this, this opportunity to, to, to share with you some, some ideas and to learn about uh, the experiences that uh, the data community is, is, uh, uh, is having and, and what, what, uh, how we are responding together to, to these challenges. Um, I, I've been uh, uh, privileged to be, to be part of, of uh, some exercises in the, that we have uh, conducted together with the World Bank and more recently with Paris 21, uh, trying to, to um, obtain more, more insights about what is the situation in the ground, what are the challenges that national statistical offices are facing, the national statistical systems are facing, how they respond. And, and it is not new and it will not be new for, for uh, anybody here. Uh, uh, if I say that uh, the, the, the pandemic really upended statistical operations everywhere. So across the world, there was no aspect of life that was not touched by the pandemic and, and, and the, the statistical production uh, national statistical systems operations uh, were no exception. So um, national statistical offices, um, all, all uh, players involved in the production of, of official statistics uh, were suddenly facing this double burden of uh, uh, an urgent increased demand for, for more granular quality data in all domains of life. Uh, so health, education, uh, employment, uh, transport, retail, sales, uh, you name it. So the demand was just uh, tremendous to be able to respond to, 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 the, to the emergency and the crisis. And at the same time, even the most basic operations of statistics data collection uh, were hampered by, by the lockdown, by the lack of the ability to conduct uh, uh, the data collection as, as we, as we were used to. So, so this also, this crisis also uh, uh, brought, brought to the fore uh, the huge differences, the, the huge divide in resources that are there between, between regions. And, and so many national statistical offices, especially in, in, in lower uh, income countries, lower and middle income countries, had to postpone their census, uh, population household census programs. So that's a major impact. Uh, in the most basic data, data uh, production operations. Um, funding limitations started to be felt very quickly, uh, particularly in those countries that, that uh, uh, um, were already uh, uh, facing, facing challenges uh, before the pandemic. And so they, many, many national statistical offices and statistical authorities had to refocus their priorities uh, uh, and, 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 and identify what are the truly mission critical operations that needed to be, to be conducted. But this pressure at the same time uh, unleashed uh, incredible creativity, incredible innovation, and, and gave us the opportunity to explore new forms of cooperation. So new collaboration with other providers, with international partners, that was very, very interesting. So what are the challenges, what have we learned? I think uh, we uh, uh, have this opportunity now to, to explore really in practice and, and see the value of uh, uh, using new data sources, of new technologies, uh, of new methods. And um, for instance, we're moving more from uh, this discussion on interoperability and more about actual re uh, uh, data integration in creating solutions that make you flexible use of different data sources uh, for the regular production of, of statistics. So the, the, the impact in terms of innovation, in terms of modernization has been very positive in, in, in a sense. And I think that, that opens up now uh, uh, 
uh, many possibilities to, to, to build on this uh, lessons learned. But the challenges in terms of resources, in terms of capacity, are still there and probably more there than before. So um, there, are, there are many, many uh, uh, priorities that have been reassessed now in terms of uh, being able to use administrative data sources, being able to connect, uh, addressing the technological divide. Um, that's what we've been seeing uh, uh, now as, as the, the, the what's, uh, what, what, what comes next now. Now, now that we the pandemic, we are not the, out of the pandemic yet, but but uh, uh, we need to start looking into the longer term. How do we become more resilient uh, in our statistical systems? How can they be ready for the next crisis, which at some point will come? Thank you. No, no I, that's exactly it. I think I think we've seen, as Haishan mentioned, that an uptick in the level and, and scope of support for national statistics systems. Uh, consequent to the to the to the pandemic, I think she'd mentioned in just the last two years that we'd seen on the order of, of more than three billion dollars, for example, from the World Bank being leveraged uh, through loans and grants uh, and credits to be able to try to help make up some of the difference. But it was just really a, a start. Um, the extent to which this kind of support is also balanced is also an important question. You know, whether we're focusing more on the frontiers or on the foundations, the fundamentals, because I think a, a balanced approach to be able to provide support across the fundamentals and the frontiers is important. And we've seen in some circumstances a heavier emphasis on, in some cases, uh, frontier investment um, on innovative solutions, which is important, but in some cases not quite as important as the more foundational investments. Um, this is part of the reason uh, why uh, we've been working together uh, and what motivated the launch of the Global Data Facility in an effort to try to bring some more coordination uh, into this space and provide a, a more kind of um, big tent approach to providing this kind of support. But from a forward planning perspective, I think that's exactly, that's exactly a question. I mean, NATI, the Open Data Charter Secretariat, has just recently launched a data taxonomy for countries' pandemic preparedness. Uh, to Luis's point, how is this helpful from a forward planning perspective in order to try to accommodate or, or, or learn from this pandemic and, and, and prevent similar circumstances from data systems moving forward? Thanks, Greg, and, and thanks for the invite and, and to all the organizers. First, um, so from, from the very beginning of, of, the, of the pandemic, the Open Data Charter started to, to uh, figure out what we could add <laughs> a value in in the data discussion. And so what we saw was a lot of our adopters and a lot of our endorsers, so both governments and, and civil society organizations trying to figure out uh, which were the key data sets, the key data that could be open in order to make the understanding of what was going on uh, bigger, broader. So to bring more transparency about uh, what the restrictions were, what uh, political decisions were made, what uh, changes were made into the, the budgets, the emergency procurement systems uh, that were put in place. So from a very humble position, what we did was we tried to come up with a first idea of what the key uh, data sets would look like. So which were the key topics that the discussions uh, around social media or even in emails or mailing groups were, were revolving around. From that, we published a first, a first version of what uh, these data cards would, would look like. And uh, we, we shared it with our broad community and we both in English and in Spanish, and we got over 200 comments um, of people saying, that, uh, yes, this data set is important, but how about that? Uh, I saw this data set being published. This is the standard that is being used. So we got a lot of, of feedback. And fortunately, we got support from, from CAF and we were able to uh, partner with, with a, an organization that helped us create these, this taxonomy. So what we did is we called it a pandemic taxonomy because of course it has a, a lot of, of data cards about COVID, but it has to do with the, the disease. So whatever the pandemic comes, uh, we, we just change that. And I, I really hope we don't get through another pandemic in our lifetime. But the idea as, as Luis was saying is to be prepared um, to be prepared just in case. So what are the key data sets that, that should be open? Uh, that being said, also context matters. So ODC, it's a global organization and the data taxonomy, I can share it. I will share it through the, to, through the chat. Um, it's kind of a global overview of which, uh, which core data sets should be open. But uh, we also worked with a lot of, of subnational governments and, and national governments in creating meetups 
online uh, meetups to understand what were the, the contextual demands of data. So of course, everybody talked about what I, what I said, like procurement data or budget data or, um, or restrictions, travel restrictions or movement restrictions. But then we discovered that of course there were local demands of data, like uh, citizens and civil society organizations were demanding specific data to each, each of the contexts. So uh, a great reminder that although it's good to have a global conversation, a global standard, uh, understanding the local needs is critical to give a, a, a really good uh, data-driven response. So the participation bit in, in, in the open data policy response uh, design, it's super important. Throughout these, these um, local meetups, of course, as I said, we understood that there were key data sets that were key everywhere, never mind the, the, the context, the language, the, it, everybody wanted to know uh, what the governments were doing and, and the, the epidemiology, uh, epidemi epidemiological data. Um, but then, of course, uh, there were certain, certain localities where uh, the schooling system data was critical others where the res movement restrictions data and the legality behind that was the most critical uh, data. There were, um, they were, they were also demanding um, understanding the, the restrictions for private, privately owned businesses. So trying to understand what they could and couldn't do if they were owners of small businesses uh, and what, which kinds of, of uh, of permissions they needed to, to have in order to work legally uh, within this context. So that exercise, both the global and the local um, and the local uh, exercise actually allowed us to release this, this taxonomy and also a series of blog posts with all the, all the input from all the local uh, meetups that we did. Uh, and also just to strengthen the, the, the point Participation is definitely definitely key in any open data policy. Um, the the technical bit we can solve, but we really do need the input from 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 the demand side of data uh, to create this virtual circle where where we we understand and and the open data policy actually has a, a, a purpose. Um, so I think I will leave it there, and I will start sharing the links in, in the chat room so that everybody can see the taxonomy. It's both in Spanish and English. Thank you. Thank you, Nati, very much. I just want maybe one additional add on question, which is the capacity of the uh, government affiliates or the local government councils that you're working with uh, to be able to release or open the data that was requested. Um, did you notice that uh, there were uh, the sufficient capacity was there or uh, were there gaps which kind of presented a roadmap of what needs to improve in anticipation of the hopefully not, but hopefully not uh, uh, the next pandemic? Whenever they weren't, they weren't read. Whenever we saw that there was a, a challenge in, in the capacity, the the good thing is that they were open to hold the the, the meetup. So they were open to uh, create a roadmap and set and set uh, the the roadmap to be ready and to prioritize also the resources to create that data or to be able to publish that data, human resources or or monetary resources. But now they understand what is the priority for the community. So uh, this participatory exercise also helped with prioritization. We know that resources are, uh, are, are small <laughs> in some places, as I said, human resources or technical capacities. Uh, now they understand what the priorities are for their own communities. So uh, even when the data wasn't released after the, the meetup, the roadmap to the creation of the data and to the release of the data based on the prioritization because of the demand of their own community was created. Fantastic. And I thank you for sharing that. I think it's really, I mean, it's a very helpful discussion because this idea of what sources of, of citizen demand and how that should shape and influence the kinds of data that should be opened and released. And it also, you know, it goes to the question of, of the capacity of, of the data producing agencies, the NSOs, to be able to do that. Um, and this is something which has been a topic of conversation, a statistical capacity or the capacity of institutions uh, um, and how to assess that effectively has been a kind of a long-standing conversation and it's gone in many different ways, but we're very lucky to have my colleague Rumor with us here, um, uh, who's just launched uh, the statistical performance indicators. Uh, Umar, congratulations on that launch. It happened just several months back. Um, can you tell us a bit about the SPI uh, and what it means for both measuring and strengthening statistical performance 
particularly as countries uh, continue to navigate their pandemic response to, to, to Nati's point and economic recovery efforts? Yeah, sure, Craig. Um, hi, everybody. A real uh, pleasure to be here. I'm uh, joining from my hometown. I'm, I'm just saying this, not that I need to say it, but my internet connection, uh, kind of my parents aren't the savviest users of data. So my internet connection also isn't the fastest. <laughs> so if you have trouble at any point hearing me, let me know. I'll switch to my uh, mobile phone. Huh? But my hometown is the best place. on it. So, but anyway, coming to SPI. Um, yeah, so it is a, a tool for uh, countries and development partners to kind of assess um, statistical systems and help identify areas for improvement. So, and then why do we do this, right? Why do we need a framework? Firstly, you need a framework to understand what to do, what the landscape is, right? Like uh, Natalia painted a very rich tapestry. And kind of what we have tried to do is kind of try to give it a framework, right? And, and why do we measure? Why do we matrix? So that you can just have a baseline and then see where to go from there. So I'll, I'll just introduce some concepts, huh, Craig, and um, you have actually heard of it before. So please don't yawn huh, because others will think uh, SPI is deficient. But, um, and, and I'll first talk about the national uh, side and then go to the subnational, huh? um, go from there step by step. So, and then kind of we all know, right? The data revolution has really changed how we use data, how we access it. And uh, COVID-19 basically put it on steroids. I mean, I'm home now and I have nowhere to hide, right? Because of Zoom and all that. So I can't even share work anymore. Now, um, all of this kind of made us realize we need to also think about data systems differently. Huh? There's the uh, physicist Max Planck who said, when you look at something differently, your understanding of it also changes. So we kind of uh, looked at what uh, Paris 21 is doing, OECD is doing, our colleagues within the bank are doing, and kind of looked at statistical performance in a, uh, in a new way. and 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 we developed the statistical performance indicators. And we tried to offer a framework that is forward looking. So it measures the entire national statistical system, huh? not just the national statistical offices. So, and all the actors kind of who produce statistics are in the framework. And um, we also uh, place a, a strong emphasis on measuring all countries, eh? less advanced ones as opposed to uh, more advanced ones. And one of the things is that transparency, right? I mean, I, I kind of I am part of the open data team at the bank. So we also made this open data, open code. So you can replicate everything. And this I think is very important in building trust in, in, in systems. And we took all of this effort so that to kind of incentivize countries and donors to kind of think about uh, how to improve their statistical performance. And there are five concepts here. Huh? Number one is data use. Again, uh, uh, we all know that is important. If you don't use it, uh, what's its use? And then secondly, it's also, uh, the, uh, we have five pillars. Huh? The first pillar was data use. The second one is data services. Like what the producers are offering, trusted data, right? Only then is data going to be used. So that's the second pillar of SPI. Now, the interaction between kind of this demand and supply determines what you produce. So data production is the third pillar of SPI and, uh, but you can't produce something out of thin air, right? The kind of, there is the Latin quote and I'll read it out so that I don't botch it. Huh? Ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing comes nothing. And this is something that is lost of no, uh, on nobody, right? I mean, that's why we have put in a lot of time on uh, producing data sources, censuses, admin data, and so on and everything, right? But finally, to deliver on all these four things, uh, um, use of data, good data services, data production, and data sources, you need a good infrastructure, right? And, and you need financing, but you also need hard infrastructure, laws and so on in place, as well as skills and so on, the soft infrastructure. So we kind of developed a framework and uh, please check it out, uh, worldbank.org slash SPI. And um, we, can, uh, we measure it for um, 174 countries. We have an index and the nice thing about the index is you can kind of, um, you can disaggregate it and see 
where exactly a country lives and lags. And for 217 countries, we have all the indicators. Now we develop this, and my kind of, and then uh, my, uh, you know, um, boss Haishans is also to have franchises, right? This is a national framework, but it can be generalized to sectors. I was talking, and the UN gender was very keen on seeing if something can be done on gender. You know, let's call it G spy. If you care about education, E spy, right? And and similarly, um, you know, the talk with you made me think about subnational data also. And it is generalizable to that. And um, I mean, you know, somebody from your country, uh, speaker Tip O'Neill said like in the eighties that all politics is local and all data also must be local, right? To make that politics uh, useful. So you kind of need to develop local uh, data systems, but it's not a trivial thing. I, I don't mean to sound uh, glib about it because it kind of would vary from country to country, depending on your statistical maturity but also your system, right? In a federal system, you would have a very different idea of a local data system than in a uh, more uh, centralized system. So in all of this kind of also links to the integrated na uh, national data system that the WDR that you were part of talks about, but I think I'll try to see if I can talk about it um, in subsequent answers, huh? if I'm, I'm given the opportunity. But th yeah, that's about it from me, Eric. Thanks, 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 Umar. Um, so, so, I mean, I think what we have just, just from Louis Zanatti and yourself is a kind of a narrative coming together about, you know, now that we have taken a clear eyed view of what the pandemic has done to, to NSOs and the larger kind of uh, statistics architecture in countries, uh, we, we're getting also a better view into what forward planning is required in order to stem the impact of a hopefully, ho hopefully avoidable, uh, but future pandemic situation. And now with the statistical performance indicators, there is a better and more sophisticated kind of mechanism now to conduct assessments more holistically about how data production is happening at the national level. As you say, it's possible uh, to be able to provide insights at the subnational level as well. And now I think coming into this question of like, how do, you, how do you match or meet the moment to provide the kind of support and capacity building institution strengthening at national subnational levels in order to act on these new newly assessed uh, uh, constraints um, in light of the pandemic and the economic recovery um, processes that are happening right now. And so to go to uh, Philippe, Paris 21 is really well known around the world um, for its country collaboration and support for national statistical development strategies. Uh, but you also have experience with designing effective statistical capacity development and institution strengthening um, efforts at the subnational level. Could you share a few key insights from your subnational engagement on developing effective strategies, again, in the context of the pandemic and, and other work that Paris 21 is currently doing. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Craig, for uh, this question. And uh, uh, thank you uh, for the organizers uh, to invite Paris 21 to be part of uh, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, very interesting one. Uh, if you look at uh, what has been said uh, from the keynote speech and uh, uh, on the panel, actually data uh, is part of our life, so we can't do without it. Uh, and to come back to your, your question, uh, Paris 21 uh, has been supporting uh, national statistical systems for the past 20 years, uh, specifically low and middle income countries to develop their national strategies for the development of statistics, which is known as uh, uh, the NSDS. And this is actually to ensure that uh, all what has been said in, uh, uh, are translated into activities to support the capacity of the national statistical system. Uh, so from the past 20 years, uh, 100 uh, low and middle income countries have developed at least their first NSDS. And some of countries are now developing even their fourth uh, uh, NSDS uh, series. So to, 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 to be uh, responsive and uh, to be uh, uh, to fit for purpose, I may say, uh, NSS tried to uh, develop 
an NSDS, which is data user driven. And the process requires indeed uh, participation, engagement, and commitment of all uh, stakeholders of the national statistical system. And the stakeholders of the national statistical systems are not only uh, public institutions as it was uh, uh, considered before, but as you said, given the pandemic uh, consequences, we are now seeing that uh, the data ecosystem is increasing too much and uh, considering uh, private sector, academia, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, communities and also, uh, uh, I may say, uh, media. And all these have to be considered when you develop your NSDS. And this is what we uh, encourage countries uh, to do. So, uh, when they develop this again to respond to data user uh, demand, uh, the process of the NSDS uh, goes through assessing capacity and data gaps of the, the national statistical system uh, and identify priorities. And those priorities uh, will guide the implementation of the NSDS. So engaging with uh, uh, a variety of stakeholders, as I was saying, is very, very important. Uh, at national level, I will come at uh, sub-national level as well, but this is needed to ensure ownership, engagement, and create commitment for uh, the implementation of the, 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 the NSDS, which uh, will definitely uh, contain priority activities that will be identified. Uh, we have seen that uh, by uh, supporting the NSDS, uh, national statistical systems uh, have increased not only their, their data production, their data quality, but also the coordination of their systems. But uh, having said uh, this, there is a lot of improvement to be done and this has, has been said actually by all of uh, the, our colleagues. Uh, and this is mainly capacity needs, which is not only uh, capacity in terms of uh, individual skills, but capacity in terms of strengthening the systems, legal framework, data governance, and so on, and also the organizational level uh, to coordinate the national statistical systems. Now, by developing the national statistical system, uh, countries include sector strategies because sector strategies uh, for the realm of statistics are also built uh, on the sector strategies for the development of the sectors. But few countries actually consider some national stakeholders uh, data demand. And this is a, 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 a big issue. And we advocate to include sub uh, national strategies for the development of statistics when countries develop their uh, national strategies for the development of statistics. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, when you look at uh, data demand from the pandemic uh, uh, consequences, you can just uh, see that this has been so much stressed uh, on developing strategies at low level, at community level, uh, and uh, service delivery at community level. You can't do it if you don't have data at uh, subnational and the local, local levels. And also uh, sometimes when you don't have a, a strong uh, quality of national data, it is obviously very simple to have to hide the incidence of any poverty or inequality that can happen at subnational level. But there is also a strong demand for disaggregated data to provide 
uh, sound base for policy uh, that targets uh, communities. And then we need really uh, data at that level. And this is very important to consider when countries uh, are developing their national statistical systems. So sub-national statistical systems should be linked to national development uh, of, uh, of statistics, I mean, national statistical systems. And to do this, uh, very quickly, uh, some actions are required, of course, at uh, sub-national level. Uh, we need to assess the, the, the users of, uh, of, of sub-national statistics and their data needs. We need to assess the existing uh, sub-national systems because there are many down there and need to be coordinated and know what they are doing. And then identify uh, strategic goals and key outputs uh, toward improving uh, the, the sub-national statistical systems. Once you have the, uh, the, the goals, then uh, identifying the, the priority actions uh, that correspond to uh, or will help to, uh, to achieve the goals and also identify the costs. Uh, the most important uh, thing also is, yes, you can develop a realistic uh, sub-national strategy for the development of statistics, but the problem is how do you mobilize resources to implement those actions? And this has been highlighted there is a, a, a big uh, uh, gap between the demand and the supply in terms of uh, resources. And this is where uh, I think the coordination of uh, donor support is very important, as well as mobilizing domestic support for subnational data. So uh, this, uh, to, to conclude, uh, uh, Craig, this uh, requires a strong political support. If there is no a strong political support, national statistical systems and sub-national statistical systems uh, will really not uh, uh, be developed and will not produce the necessary data demand. But there is also a need to coordinate uh, funding from development partners uh, support. Uh, and uh, uh, this requires uh, new mechanisms. And uh, this has uh, been highlighted by Aishan in her uh, introduction. And uh, I can mention here the Clearing House for better uh, funding for better uh, development data, which has been uh, launched uh, recently in the, the World Data Forum. So this is very important to be in place and then increase the campaign uh, around the need for sub-national statistics. And uh, of course, their usefulness uh, uh, in, in, in our lives and the systems, while they are uh, identified and supported, then we can expect to have at least a minimum data that are required to support uh, community policies. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you, Philippe. And, and I'm really glad that you, you, you touched on this. I think this idea of, well, the first, what I was, I, was, I found a, a, a strategy support document uh, that Paris 21 had developed just a few years ago on subnational data system strategy development. And I thought it was really compelling. And it makes the point that you've just suggested that this subnational development process must be connected to a national process, but it's specific and highly contextual. It goes to Nati's point and Al's earlier point about the, the crucial role of hyperlocal engagement at the community level in order to discern priorities, understand what demand looks like, and then see how you can shape support in order to meet that demand uh, from context to context. Um, and so, you know, this is this is quite quite a I, I think at least a heartening uh, reflection set of reflections on the role and in, in, in importance and centrality of, of community driven development or engagement on these issues first, given the, the kind of history, the longer history, um, uh, you know, and both of our organizations, let's say 10 plus years ago, I uh, had undertaken similar efforts to try to take a much more kind of top down approach, but doing top down and bottom up at the same time by acknowledging and making space in these processes for grassroots engagement is a huge step, uh, I think, in the right direction. Um, and, and, and that is also motivating new insights and new funding priorities that will, will be able to inform and shape some of the support that you, you, you mentioned. 
uh, through things like the Global Data Facility, which can then also be identified through the, the clearinghouse. Um, I, I want to encourage um, uh, those of our, our participants who are interested to drop some questions in the chat. I see, I see that we've got two. I'm going to come to them in just a minute. I just, given, Philippe, what you've just mentioned, I really do want to come to Silvana. Um, and, 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 and given this discussion, Silvana, on community engagement, starting with the community uh, to, do, to be able to discern priorities and then and working through them in order to craft strategy and, 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 and support processes. You know, one of ILDA's key strategic areas is community support. Um, and there's a big emphasis that you and your team have, have taken on enabling discussions on social, political, economic issues in which data play a key role. Um, maybe you could share your experiences uh, about how to better equip communities with data um, uh, to enable data-informed discourse and decision-making. So what, what in your estimation has worked and why, why is this kind of engagement important? First of all, thank you, Craig, and thank you for, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And without even knowing what the other participants were going to say, I mean, I think we are all in the same line talking about engagement and participation, I think apparently is a key ingredient to all the different, uh, even if it's national, global, subnational, that's something that we all need to work and we need to stress. And so in that regard, I wanted to share just a, a few ideas coming from the work that we've been doing at ILDA for almost a decade, uh, since 2012 uh, in Latin America, and also coming from the recently uh, implementation of the Global Data Barometer at, at the more global level. <clears throat> but despite uh, if it's uh, regional, global, national, and subnational, I mean, we, we are working in, in different lines uh, in order to support communities. I mean, we are trying to have uh, reflections that go beyond the publication of the data and their quality. We try to promote debates regarding the social, political, and economic problems in which the data could have a relevant role. Uh, and basically, in many cases, what we did uh, is to support these agendas through different networks, could be the OD4D network in Latin America, it could be the, the current, I mean, today and, and tomorrow, uh, we are organizing the Condato Sabre Latam annual event that we have with the data community in Latin America. We are also collaborating with several other regional networks, including uh, the data against feminicide that we are uh, creating and supporting these days. But um, just to put uh, some assumptions there, uh, we work assuming that by developing research processes in a participatory manner, uh, we engage and involve relevant actors we support community of practices, we carry out experimental proje projects, and we support training in strategic areas. All of these, uh, we are trying to do that, acting as bridges between different communities, practices, and knowledge. And one of the things that we care the most is about uh, share this knowledge and learning from these communities, these peoples, and these actors, but specifically taking into account actors that traditionally do not have a voice. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, my reflections are coming uh, from, from that idea in, in particular. Uh, the idea that this knowledge can inform dialogues, uh, and design public policies, and think about strategic issues at the regional and global level. Uh, so in that sense, what we are trying to do is to contribute to making data processes more open and inclusive. And when I'm thinking about some of the reflections that I have in my head, I'm thinking mostly in terms of uh, what public organizations, NGOs, academics uh, that are publishing, using, or promoting the work with data could do or could, should think when uh, doing some of these things. Could be a tool, could be a training, uh, could be designing a standard, could be designing a measurement, or could be any other data-related project. Um, in a general sense, uh, we work under one premise, that is that in the information age, we have data, and with that, we can make decisions, we can nurture public policies that are based on this reality captured by the data. But this premise has one problem. The data does not usually count all people and all contexts. Again, we are going back to what it was mentioned before about how important uh, context is how context ma matters in all the things that we do. Even though we think about sometimes data uh, as something neutral, 
it is a neutral. And, and, and we have different views of the world and different people and different contexts have different uh, approaches to, to the data. So in that sense, uh, if we don't use the right categories to understand why we are collecting data and publishing data, we are not gonna have the right data. And without it, uh, designing policies that offer solutions to diverse group of people, uh, and even more broadly to promote social change is incredibly difficult. So that's the reason that it's really important to think about some of the things we do uh, when we discount certain people or groups in our data choices. So it's really important to be accountable about that and to think about inclusion when it comes to, to data production. So this idea is very present in our work. It could be at the subnational, national, regional, or global level from our work with uh, violence against LGBTQ people in Central America, the standardization of data on data on feminicide, research on migration, women in contracting, and the reflections that we did on how to build standards in an inclusive manner, just to put an examples. And also a more current one at the global scale is about how we try to include questions and set questions related to gender disaggregated data and also marginalized population depending on the different contexts in the first edition of the global data barometer. We think again that context matters and we need to understand different realities and different, work, uh, different groups to better equip them uh, with the things that they need, with the data that they need and the analysis that they need in a given country or city and also to offer solutions. So just three points uh, and then we can later keep discussing about inclusion. Some of the things that I want to share that probably it could be common sense, but I think it's still very important because we don't usually think about them in advance when we are thinking about projects uh, regarding data or any other type of tool regarding uh, data. Uh, in every decision uh, that, that we take, uh, we have the potential to include or exclude people and social groups in our data. So this decision should be taken into consideration at the beginning of the design of any process. I mean, again, talking about tools, other data publication, and it doesn't have to be an aftermath math, uh, that is not calculated in advance. Uh, the diversity of opinions, world views have to be included, not just as a consultation over the final product, but understanding that these voices should be part of the creative process. Um, some of the questions that we need to think about uh, when we are designing a data project or a tool is who is at the table? What are the roles of people in, in the process? Uh, are we involving as many perspectives as possible? I mean, do we have a feedback loop to include all these opinions in, in the way that we are creating and constructing different projects? And are the needs identified by the people, the constituency they represent and the spending uh, community of experts being considered? Because the second point is also related to this first one. That is, we need to consider multiple users, their context, and their different needs. Because we, what we've seen in, in different projects is that in many cases, even with the best intentions, if we don't talk to the potential users or the people who use the data that we are collecting or that could be affected by the tools that we are building, we might be putting people at risk and create, creating harm because we didn't listen to them. And we assume certain ideas just based on our context and our point of view. And also another thing that we need to take into account is to be uh, explicit about the roles and relationships during implementation of any of these projects uh, to ensure sustainability throughout uh, a research project, a tool design, or a standard creation, uh, what we need to have in mind is a feedback loop before and after its, its implementation, uh, because this cannot be achieved without thinking about the roles and the relationships. I mean, having clear frameworks is also necessary to understand and support the role of each actor and what is expected uh, of them. In that sense, I mean, uh, when we are talking about building capacity, more than capacity is to understand the people that we are talking to and the people that we are including in the work that we do. Uh, again, this is to keep in mind when we are thinking about building 
a tool when we are thinking about opening data, I mean, to know the demand as it was already mentioned. And in all of, the, all of these things, uh, to sum up, what we need to do is don't assume. So don't think about your context and your particular point of view, but go out there, go and find that demand or the potential users or the potential people that could be harmed with the data or the tools and include as many voices as possible. These are just basic ideas, but I think we need to take them into account uh, so we can think about a more open and inclusive uh, a community uh, regarding data, regarding tools, regarding even uh, when we are so talking also about algorithms that we can build with the data that we are publishing and creating these days. I can go on and on forever, but I'm gonna stop there and I can leave a few ideas for later. Hey, thank you, Savannah. No, I was gonna ask you to keep going. I, 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 let me, well, let me ask you this. And, and maybe, maybe actually, let me, let me pivot to Nati because I, I think what Open Data Charter has also done is something analogous in, the, in this kind of engagement at the community level to be able to discern priorities and then inform policymaking processes. Um, you know, these processes are not um, are time consuming and they're not resource neutral. Uh, they can be kind of expensive. So I'd be interested in hearing from from Savannah, Nati, kind of how how this is how this is working in practice. I think in principle, when you have uh, you know, a project or a donor engagement, um, you know, where where you are able to facilitate this level of connectivity and then build out uh, a summary of what the priorities are and then use that um, uh, to inform a, a policy process or an open data process. It, it's, 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 it's highly feasible when there are resources there, but, but how are communities doing it in the absence of this kind of support um, and, 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 and in the absence of resources? Or is that, is that exactly the issue? Uh, Silvana, maybe you could speak to that quickly and then I can ask Nati the same question. Uh, yes, I, I can go first. I think one, one, one of the things that we need to do and to keep in mind is not to think about that once we are implementing the project. Uh, when we are even thinking about the resources that we need to design something, it could be uh, a tool, it could be a standard, it could be a, a, I mean, the publication of certain data. Uh, we need to think in, in advance and we need to put that on paper that we need to uh, have the resources or the time. I mean, it could be little, it could be big depending on, on the project and the resources available, but that should be a step to be taken into account uh, because if not, uh, the harm uh, could be much more costly later. So. There are many ways to do it. Probably one of the things is try to reach a community of practices in the area that you are working with. I mean, uh, when we are talking about, for example, gender-based violence, that is something that we are working a lot. Um, we are reaching the organization. We are reaching the public officials working on those areas. And we are asking them, I mean, even before uh, publishing any version of the standard that we are now uh, working on in, in Latin America. I mean, the first few months we spend that time, first of all, thinking about is this a problem that we can face or that we can add some value uh, through data because we are a data related organization. Second of all, I mean, is uh, something that the people working for many years and in different areas of the problem think that is a problem as well. And also, I mean, uh, thinking about how we incorporate the different views for the, the particular uh, problem to the project that we are building. And, and again, we are spending many years now talking to different people and different communities and also trying to build a community of practice around data and feminicide that includes uh, public sector, that includes uh, individual mappers, that include academics, journalists, NGOs, uh, because that's something that also we need to take into account that we, I mean, at least the organizations that we are here, we cannot as bridges, building bridges, because in many cases, uh, there's kind of a, a relationship that is, is not very old in a way, uh, in, in particular areas, uh, when, especially when we are thinking, for example, uh, gender-based violence and those kind of things. Uh, so we need to act as bridges to uh, make people coming together and discuss the different points of view, because at the end of the day, they are all working with the same goal in mind. The problem is probably they are talking about these different uh, 
problems in a different language. And what we can do to improve that situation is to help uh, those dialogues uh, to, to happen. And at the end of the day, we are all working towards the same goal. So uh, plan ahead, think about the time and the resources and the people that you need to have in your project to make it inclusive. And also thinking who are these people that can also bring other type of communities to the table and, and give you a, another perspective that probably is not the one that you're having in mind. Thank you. That's, uh, so let me come to Nati and some sim similar question, which is, uh, so this is one from the chat about how, how open data charters approach citizens and in general, how you've managed to, 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 to undertake local level engagement to facilitate mm -hmm. involvement in policymaking. Um, on, on data priorities. Maybe you could speak to that uh, just for a moment. Yeah, yeah, and, and thanks for, for the question. So um, I don't have a lot to add what, to what Silvana said, uh, just, just to uh, add what, we, what we've done, because we've done what, what Silvana said, like whenever we design a project, an implementation project, we do uh, think about the resources for the participation uh, for the, for the participation process involved in, in that project. So for us, uh, for us, it's crucial to have the resources and the time to, to develop a participatory process in whichever open data project we are working with. Um, one of the things that we always do, because I don't know if everybody here knows, but we're a small team. Uh, so we always partner with local organizations that already uh, of course, understand the context better than us, but also um, already know the, the open data community uh, within a specific country or county or province, when, wherever we are, we're working. So we can tap into the already existing uh, networks within the, the country where we're working. Um, so connecting and, and, and understanding and bringing our knowledge, but also understanding that we have a lot to learn from the local organizations um, makes our work uh, richer, if you, if you will. Um, and, and then of course, um, we used to do a lot of in-person meetings uh, as part of the participatory process. We had to go virtual because of, of the pandemic. And what we, what we did with, for example, for the taxonomy project, for the COVID ta taxonomy project is, we developed a methodology alongside with, with uh, New Zealand's government because they were the ones that actually wanted, like the first ones that asked, like, can we do this together? Can we do this meetup? Can we set up a, a methodology? And we created a methodology and open it up for our community. Um, so we have a document that I will, I will also share where we actually created uh, a couple of questions to guide that conversation, uh, even a template to fill in to, to be able then to compare all the meetups that were, were going to happen. So all the answers from all, all the different meetups were gathered in the same template. Uh, so then you can, you can actually understand what the local differences and, 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 the, and the points, points that matched uh, between the different contexts where the meetups were being held uh, could, could be reached. So we, what we did is create a methodology, uh, the, best, the best one we could, of course, all all the participatory methodologies uh, always I are never, sorry, uh, written on stone. You always need to uh, be able to be innovative and creative and understand the, the needs. We know that going virtual actually um, leaves some people behind because not everybody has uh, connectivity as a secured, uh, as secured everywhere as in, for example, New Zealand. Um, but but we need we what, that was the way that we were able to to navigate the the pandemic and and being uh, being secured because of, of of well of course of the pandemic restrictions. Um, so what we always do is what Silvana actually said. So we we secure and plan ahead and include uh, in the budget the the participatory bit. It's not something that that you do at the end of the project. It has to be designed into whatever open data policy that you're, you're trying to, to come up with. We always collaborate with local organizations uh, to bringing that, that already existing network of, of knowledge, of community of practices and, uh, and the connections. Um, and, and also, well, as I said, bring in our, our knowledge. Um, and, and yes, I do think like talking even with, with, with you, with the World Bank, I do think there's a, there's a, um, a resources challenge 
uh, its participatory processes are not uh, prioritized sometimes in, in budgets. We like the, the certain needs for for more kind of hardcore uh, needs, you know, the technical, the, the computers and, and internet and things like that. And maybe the, the participation process that actually takes a lot of time if you want to get it right. Uh, it does need resourcing and, and it's something that, that uh, we need to take more, uh, more attention to when, whenever we are deciding this. Um, so I will, I will leave also here the link for the, for the methodology that we created for the meetups uh, for, for COVID. Um, and hopefully it can, it can also be helpful for other participatory processes, but we tried to make it um, to help out the Open Data Charters network in this, in this pandemic. Thank you, Nati. Um, and the, I, I, I think the resource question is one that's also foremost on many people's minds. This is also something I should have mentioned in the context of the global data facility, the kind of matchmaking or gap filling role of the burn network clearinghouse. We can speak a bit more about this perhaps in the breakout. I, we have about uh, 15 or so more minutes um, for this discussion. Um, and so I wanna take a few more questions and then if there's time, I can come back to the question on, on financing that was, that was popped in the chat. Um, you know what's really relevant here, I think, is 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 I think it's it's very heartening to be able to have this this consistent or increasingly consistent um, emphasis on participation, on inclusion, on community engagement, on the prioritization exercise, and to ensure that uh, NSS support and capacity building, institution strengthening is meant to be able to help fill gaps in. Uh, uh, people who have previously been invisible to Haishan's point or, or, or giving voice to the voiceless in these, in these prioritization exercises. Um, what's interesting about the, the, the statistical performance indicators is that it takes a much broader view um, about what it means to measure and strengthen statistical performance in order to create value um, for not just government agencies, but also for, um, uh, for the public. And there is a question here for Umar about, you know, how can you share insight at a high level about how the, the indicators in the SPI were prioritized, you know, particularly with that, with that recognition of there being broader value generation and opportunities uh, for data use by outside of government? Yeah, I guess, um, Craig, the issue is that, um, Again, the, the first things I come back to is also um, the need first of kind of getting our uh, fuzzy thinking straight. And for that, the need of a framework, right? And, 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 and that's why, again, in the SPI, we focused on those five areas, huh? data use, uh, data services, data productions, data sources, and data infrastructure. So, and, um, once you develop the framework, you kind of know what indicators to look for. So I think in, in, in many cases, there is also a lot of disquiet. There is a lot of data, but then on many things, we don't have any indicators and data. And I think it's also because kind of we often don't have a framework and we often haven't thought about the system, the infrastructure that is needed to produce uh, those indicators. So kind of, we went about it in a bit of a purposive way with the um, SPI, right? Like, okay, what are the areas you want to focus on? And they were kind of, we divided up into five pillars and 22 dimensions, huh? these uh, areas. And then we went about finding how to measure these and we came up with 51 indicators. Now, um, we don't have indicators on everything we want to measure, but we slowly want to get there. And, and the uh, important thing of having a framework is that then you know what is missing, people can call you out on it and you actually collect it, right? Um, because people uh, are, are, are kind of the users, especially are clamoring already in the SPI, I hear, oh, you don't measure um, data used by academia and so on. And you know, we are working with Philippe's team on to see how government uh, uses uh, data and so on. So I, I, I guess that's how kind of you would go about uh, finding the indicators uh, we have. And in a subnational context, again, because you know, I, I hear a lot about missing data and so on. And, and I, I think it just boils down to a missing infrastructure, right? And this is something your WDR kind of also 
talks about, the SPI also talks about it. So we really need to sit down and think in detail on what is, because your data system must mirror your structure of them, right? You can't have something um, completely different from it. What your level of maturity is, is your, I mean, you know, are you basic? Are you highly advanced? Are you somewhere in the middle? So, and are you a federated system, a highly centralized system? What does a local data system mean in each of these contexts? All of these are very context specific. And, you know, Silvana said she believes in a diversity of opinions, kind of let a thousand flower bloom. And I think you definitely need to do that given all the actors, all the um, kind of uh, users, producers, and so on. And, um, you know, let's try to fit it within some framework to give it a structure. So, and, and I do urge um, kind of the listeners here to check out what the WDR has to say on the integrated national data system, because it's not like calling for a Leviathan or something or a centralized thing, rather it respects what your governance system is and says that the data system must be kind of mirroring that, right? So yeah, Craig, I, I, I hope my uh, answer, I kind of answered your question a little bit. As brilliant as, as always, Omar, thank you. Uh, so, and I mean, so I, but I think what was useful here is, is, is if you're thinking about these as kind of combined resources, right? I mean, the SPI, the WDR, uh, INDS framework, I'm gonna squeeze in more acronyms in a minute, but the, the point is, is taken together, these, pre these present an opportunity to take a prism or a lens and look at national, subnational data uh, statistical needs uh, in terms of uh, gaps in data or data production processes, in terms of institutional opportunities to provide strengthening human capital, um, as well as the larger uh, infrastructure uh, to enable data collection analysis and use. Um, and, and there's a lot of moving parts. And that's why I think that's what speaks in, in part to the value proposition of the, of the NSDS, the National Statistics Development, Statistical Development Strategy. Um, there's a question in the chat for Philippe about what the best way for civil society, non-government actors to proactively engage with NSOs when it comes to the development of, of, an, of an NSDS. Is this something which is baked in um, or is it normative or is it something which uh, you see a kind of only variably and how do you manage to get that a bit more mainstream? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Craig. Um, this, is, this, this is a, a good question indeed. Um, and uh, I think that the, the NSO or the national statistical offices or the national statistical systems should learn to work with other data providers. And most of the other data providers are civil society organizations that are working with communities. So uh, the issue here is how do we encourage national statistical offices to uh, involve civil society organizations in the planning process. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really very, uh, very important. And uh, statistical offices uh, have started already thinking uh, uh, of working with uh, civil society organizations on what uh, we call citizens generated data. And these data are subnational data, are community data. They are, uh, they are not even, in many cases, not national representative data. So uh, NSOs will not probably uh, be involved in data production, but at least we involve civil society organization in the planning, discuss with them, know what they are producing, and uh, see how those data can be, uh, uh, I mean, generated and disseminated through official reporting. Because some of the SDGs uh, are not informed by the usual mechanisms of data production by the, N the NSS or the NSOs, uh, while they can be informed from citizens-generated data, 
uh, collected and disseminated by civil uh, society organizations. So uh, we, 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 we are all talking about inclusiveness, participatory approach, engagement, and so on. I think that's the way the NSDS development uh, should look like. And the guidelines for the NSDS uh, development actually uh, insist on the participation and co considering the uh, other data sources. Can it be citizen generated data, can it be big data, uh, but this is very important now if national statistical offices need to report timely and leave no one behind. There is no, <laughs> I don't see any other way to go uh, if they don't collaborate and include, involve civil society organizations in the NSDS uh, process and implementation. That's where they will identify activities that are being implemented by other actors. Otherwise, uh, they will just uh, be there producing the GDP, the CPI, and uh, and the 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 the, 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 uh, the national surveys. And I'm sure Umar will not be able to monitor some of the SPI indicators. So. I, I, I think that's good, and I like uh, very much the approach that uh, uh, Silvana and Natalia uh, were describing. Indeed, uh, we are actually uh, gender data uh, a focus, a big focus for Paris Twenty One now. And what we are doing is trying to uh, adv advocate, help, and support countries to mainstream gender data in the NSDS, the National Strategy for the Development of Statistics Development, uh, and ensure that they will take into consideration uh, sector levels, uh, sub-national de data demand, uh, but uh, also considering other uh, uh, data, 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 data providers, uh, which are not normally included in the normal national statistical system uh, as I said earlier, uh, the, the, the data ecosystem has increased too much, and this needs, uh, again, capacity for the NSO to be able to coordinate, uh, to be a data steward than just being there and producing key uh, or, or, or structural data and leave behind uh, other available information that are produced by other data providers. So it is really very important for me that uh, civil society organizations are involved earlier in the process of uh, statistical planning so that the coordination will be easier and everyone will define which priority uh, should be taken on board and how it should be uh, implemented and how uh, resource, mobilization, uh, resource mobilization should be uh, done. Because sometimes we say there is no resources, but maybe there is bad coordination or lack of coordination of existing resources, which makes it maybe uh, not efficient and uh, bring about some uh, duplication of efforts. So, that again, we come to your question that which we come in the breakout session on uh, the, 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 the clearing house and the global uh, facility, uh, fund facilities, the data facilities. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I can say on that. Uh, I think uh, NSO, NSS should ensure that they leave no one behind in terms of uh, data stakeholders when they are developing their national strategy for development of statistics. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Philippe. I, I, I mean, it's really key insights there. And, and for what it's worth, I, I'm just going to pop into the chat uh, a quick summary of Paris 21's recent work on, on subnational gender statistics, so just to bear out a bit what you're talking about, because it's a hugely important area. Um, and maybe hopefully one we can go into in a bit more, possibly in, in, the, in the breakout. Um, so, so, but I think this, this conversation, uh, which is rapidly coming to a close, uh, is, is, is really important. And a lot of it is 
turned, I think, on this on this question of of of, of resourcing. I think a few uh, comments uh, in in the chat have really landed on, you know, the fact that uh, participatory processes and budget development, but also on data prioritization, are expensive. They're time consuming. Um, you know, how can developing countries make data mining a, a better priority for budgeting and resource allocation? To your question, Philippe, about whether or not there are efficiencies or allocative processes which might prioritize data, possibly in the existing budget, instead of requiring new or additional financing. The clearinghouse um, that the Burn Network has developed is also identifying financing flows into the data space across uh, regions and the extent to which that may or may not be transforming into the kinds of institutional strength or capacity that uh, it's, it's supposed to be doing. The Global Data Facility is also serving as a bit of a um, a coordination mechanism and a, and a, and a prioritization uh, kind of drive to try to encourage more and better financing for data statistics priorities in a way that that can promote more durable outcomes, more durable impact, and, and move away from the kind of short term hit and run style engagements that we've seen in some other contexts. Um, so this question of fund financing is really a clearly a pivotal one. And so just maybe my last question, but just to kind of roll up some of what we've seen in the chat. And we can dig in a bit more into these uh, into these questions also in the breakouts in a few minutes. But I want to come back to Luis, who started us off today, um, and I want to ask just specific to the financing questions. Getting a clear view about what the key financing priorities or constraints are is clearly mission critical uh, for this discussion. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the most recent NSO survey round uh, between uh, the UN, the World Bank, and Paris 21 yielded some important findings on financing challenges and needs uh, experienced by NSOs um, and subnational units around, around the world. Um, Luis, maybe you could jump in and just share a few key insights about the most pressing needs that have been identified from this recent survey round and how the international community can position itself to deliver on these needs more effectively. Yeah, thank you, Craig, for, for bringing that, that up and the, the, the findings that uh, we start to get from, from this uh, service. So as, as um, Umar well, well said, uh, 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 nothing comes from thin air. And uh, we, we've been uh, uh, seeing that in this, this, this context of uh, increased demand uh, for delivery, uh, uh, so, so NSOs are expected to deliver more. Uh, they are also, in, particularly in the, in, in, in the most uh, challenged countries, particularly in, in, in uh, the, the countries with, with the lowest uh, income, they are facing uh, budgetary delays. So the, the, the basic budget to conduct operations uh, is not coming. Um, uh, surgical offices are, are saying more than 60% of, of uh, either countries uh, depend on development cooperation to, to, to carry out a uh, significant part of, of their operations. So there is a real need for, for resources, uh, uh, financial, uh, like uh, hard money needs to be put into uh, addressing some of the infrastructure uh, needs. So for instance, we, we, we see all the great potential of uh, of uh, the, the use of new technologies of integrating data. But for that, you need to invest uh, in, in uh, hard infrastructure that costs that costs money to be run, like uh, uh, cloud infrastructure, connectivity, and so on. So these are large investments that, that are uh, uh, very much overdue. And, and so it is not only uh, about finding more efficiencies, which there are plenty of, there's plenty of room for that. There is, there is a, a clear need to, to mobilize funding that, that, that goes into, into this basic level uh, of, of uh, uh, infrastructure, both in terms of hard infrastructure and this, this uh, training of, of, of staff, being able to retain your staff for, for, uh, um, uh, to operate uh, in, this new, in this new world. Um, there is uh, increased uh, uh, willingness uh, of, of uh, uh, different agencies, for instance, international agencies, to pull their efforts in, in conducting joint capacity development uh, programs. That, that is all, all welcome. But um, 
I, I just don't want to to uh, stop emphasizing that uh, the, the the funding is 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 much needed for for statistical operations. As as Haishan said in her initial remarks, uh, as an investment, no. So statistics is not a cost. Uh, center is a, it's a, it's a value uh, delivering center. Thank you very much, Luis. And, and um, perhaps we will, we'll pop into the chat uh, a link uh, to the, to the survey findings because they're really, really insightful and very helpful, I think, in, as they kind of craft entry points and opportunities to provide more support. And they paint, <coughs> me, <coughs> pardon me, a, a very comprehensive picture about the effect of the pandemic on SOs, but also the larger question about where financing is most critically needed and the kind of support that could then be channeled thereafter. So having this, this, uh, this kind of source of, of, of guidance, in addition to the other, um, uh, the WDR, the SPI, the NSDSs, I think really helps round out, I think, this picture about what kind of support is needed um, where. Um, we're, we've come to time. So let me just first say, Thank you very much again, uh, Al, Jay, and colleagues at the Open Institute uh, for this chance to have this discussion. Uh, thank you for the forbearance of our participants who, who have um, been with us uh, for the duration. Thank you, Luis, uh, Nati, Umar, Philippe, and Silvana for sharing your insights. And, um, and we very much look forward to, several of us will be, will be in the breakout sessions to continue and dig a bit deeper into, into this process. So perhaps, um, uh, we could uh, come back to you, Al, and you uh, can explain what we do next. Thanks indeed, uh, again. This was a truly wonderful conversation. I didn't actually expect to be as intrigued as I am, but I have, you're going to hear from me. Uh, certainly, Philip, you're going to be hearing from me. Uh, Natalia, you're going to be hearing from me. Um, almost immediately after this, lots of emails coming through, and Omar as well. Um, so we're going to be breaking out, uh, going into breakout. Um, uh, and, and the breakout has already been organized. Um, the, they are going to be moderated um, by Ravi Kumar, who I think is here. Um, Mark Kirura of the Open Institute um, is also going to be uh, moderating uh, another one. Um, and so um, they, we had anticipated having many more, but considering that there are not that many, so we've, we've sort of, uh, we're, we're not that many now, we are um, sort of contracting them a little bit so that we can have two uh, breakout groups. Um, and the big discussions, the one that is moderated by Ravi Kumar is gonna be on subnational data and capacity building, um, statistical capacity building specifically. Um, and Mark is gonna be moderating a, um, a conversation around putting data to work at local, um, for local level decision-making. Um, so what will happen is that um, you, you, all of us need to do nothing. Um, the, the guys at the back are going to do something and we're all going to end up um, in one or the other of the groups. Um, so please enjoy yourself. Um, we look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, we started at, you know, something interesting is that we started at five o'clock 5 p.m. East Africa time, and we are ending at 5 p.m. GMT, which is an interesting observation for me. Um, I have had a, a great time today, and I just want to say um, thank you very much to all of you. Um, and I wanted to just give um, Ravi and Mark as the leaders for those two breakouts one minute each to to tell us just the the you know the biggest. Um, take away um, that the individual groups have had. Um, and then after that, I will invite Craig um, to say one last word um, before we, we close out all together. It is our intention to finish at the top of the hour. So one minute, Ravi. Ravi, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure what's happening. You can hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Al. Um, I, I, first, I want to thank uh, Craig and uh, Philippe, uh, yourself, uh, and uh, Peter, Chris, and others uh, for, uh, for joining the breakout room. I found it very, very useful. Just uh, very quickly, uh, I think some of the, the big things, big themes we heard was the importance of collaboration um, to strengthen the national and subnational data systems, the importance of being user-driven. And 
you know, really understanding what the demands are on the on the local at the local level, and um, the the importance of that. Uh, uh, the data must be used because without using the data, you understand you won't know what the quality of data is. So you know, the, the, we, you, we, you have to create this uh, positive, uh, uh, a virtuous uh, uh, cycle, uh, and and of course, you know, we also heard from uh, one of our colleagues in the breakout room the importance of um, open communications to ensure transparency and accountability um, across the board when we are working um, to build uh, strengthen uh, the. And national and some national data ecosystems. So, in the interest of time, I'll just pause here and over to you. Thank you, and Mark. Okay, thanks. Al. So, from from our end, a couple of thoughts. The first one is, um, you know, the the government might not set policy based on a small data set, but it is important to show them and to, to show them the value, um, to show the value to the public especially, and also to, to show that value, especially through the publication of the data. So publishing information was really uh, important for us. Um, the other thing that we talked about had to do with uh, uh, expecting the citizens to also kind of become experts in data. Uh, sometimes that will not happen. We shouldn't be, that should not be our goal. Our goal should be to, to foster that uh, um, accountability and transparency. And, and, and they, they may not necessarily become data actors. And, you know, and by that, like one example that was given is, they, they, you know, you, these connectivity challenges sometimes at the local level. So it is important either for the government actors or even the leaders to come and engage with their communities at that local level. And then lastly, um, that even the local data ecosystem is embedded within a national system. So there has to be some sort of coordination for, for standards, for interoperability of data, so that we are, we are able to report, we are able to track progress. So some coordination is required from, from national level. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and thank you so much um, to everyone. I'm gonna beg your indulgence because we had one minute of time and I, and I do want to say something uh, after Craig says something. So Craig, may I just invite you to um, close us out um, uh, before I, uh, we, we leave? Thanks, thanks, Al. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Al, you asked me for one word, and that word is thanks. Uh, thanks to all of our, our, our participants. Thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm thanking also uh, Ravi and Mark for, for facilitating these great uh, breakup group uh, discussions. And, and just, I think we covered a lot of ground today, and we covered a lot of very important um, substance. And I think we had surfaced some, some key messages. I won't repeat them all, but this idea that, that starting at the subnational level, starting with community level engagement and ensuring that prioritization processes are feeding up into national level priorities and ensuring that there are mechanisms in place to be able to react and provide services and, and, and you leverage that data and use it for decision making to the benefit of the, of the subnational level um, is, is, is a, where there's clear agreement. And I think that it's very heartening to see that there are, there's a groundswell of additional work and support moving in those directions. Um, and there's a lot more to do. Obviously, this is only the start. And I think, as um, Haishan had mentioned at the top of the meeting this morning, there are a new array of tools and mechanisms that are, that are coming now into force, which are designed to be more supportive of this agenda very specifically. And I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic that in the near to medium term, we'll see a lot more engagement um, in this space specifically. We have a lot more to learn from the Open Institute and from other colleagues uh, about subnational data desks, building capacity, institutional strengthening at that level, and how that rolls up into national level engagement and priority decision making. But um, uh, we're, the most important message here is, is we're very keen to, to, to continue to learn and to continue to do this together. Um, so, so let me just, I'll stop there and say thank you again to everyone, and we very much look forward to continuing this engagement and communication. 
Thank you so much, Craig. And from us at the Open Institute, we want to thank everybody who is here because without you, we would not have been able to make this particular session a success. We are so grateful to all of you, both the, um, the panelists um, and the speakers, as well as the people who attended via WOVA. And um, we're, we're really just really happy that this has happened. Consider this an open invitation to all of you that are in this room, that if you do want to attend the other two sessions, tomorrow there's a session on um, putting philanthropy at the center, I've been putting citizens at the center of philanthropic decisions. Um, and the day after that, we shall be having a conversation about um, data governance. Should you want to attend any of this, just email j at openinstitute.africa um, and j and Benjamin and the team will make sure that um, you, you are accommodated and a ticket is issued to you. Um, thank you very much to everyone. Please do, um, uh, you know, keep engaging. I know that uh, a number of you are going to be hearing from us um, and we hope that you will be open to engaging a lot more. Best wishes um, from my end. Good night. Um, have a great day for those of you that are just starting out. Um, thank you and goodbye.